Uh, Dr. Wasserfall obtained his MD from the University of Stellenbosch, South, uh, Cape Town, South Africa. He's been, a pra been practicing as a family doc in Canada since 2001, and he's currently a f in family practice in Vancouver, focusing on HIV care. He's also a clinical associate at the HIV Urban Infectious Ward at St. Paul's Hospital. Uh, he underwent training in high-resolution anoscopy and is a member of the International Anal Neoplasia Society and a consulting physician at St. Paul's Hospital Anal Dysplasia Clinic. So welcome, thank you. Thank you. For that introduction. Hi everybody, um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, it's hard for me when they said I only have 10 minutes for this talk because I'm obviously very enthusiastic about this topic. Um, some of it might be repetition. Uh, Michelle did a great job at looking at the HPV things and I'm gonna talk about anal cancer and anal dysplasia and really you cannot talk about those two entities without talking about HPV because it's all related. Just to recap for, you, for those of you in the, among the audience who don't know maybe what dysplasia means, dysplasia just means cells anywhere in the body, you can get it in any place, that grows abnormally. They're not cancer cells, cancer cells, uh, you know, it's a different uh, uh, histological diagnosis, but they are just cells that with the potential of become, um, becoming malignant. So these are the two things. Um, Actually, it's a continuum of a condition that I'm going to talk to you about. So, yeah, so as you've heard, I work at Spectrum, which is a gay men's health clinic mainly, and we focus on HIV care. And then I'm one of the doctors working at the St. Paul's Anal Displeasure Clinic, where we try to pick up precancerous uh, anal cancer cells and treat them, and hopefully detect cancer early in, li early in patients' lives to um, better the outcomes. So these are my disclosures. So what, my talk is going to be a little bit more difficult, because, uh, different because obviously I'm a doctor, so it's going to be a little bit more clinical. Uh, so the majority of anal cancers is squamous cell carcinomas, and I'll come. Why I put that up is because I want to just break the myth that I often hear from patients that colorectal cancer and anal cancer is the same thing. It's, it's totally different things and totally different cells. So uh, squamous cells you find in the oral cavity in the throat, in the anus, not in the colon, and not in the rectum. Uh, of course, we've heard this is the strongest association with um, the HPV virus and HPV infection. Different figures have been quoted. Michelle said 90%. Different studies, 80 to 85%. It depends on what study you read. And then this might be a little bit controversial, but we believe this, although there's no natural history study to prove it, although Australians are doing one at the moment, that the precursor of anal cancer really is um, anal dysplasia, or, or we use it uh, intraepithelial neoplasia. The, it's basically the same thing, that's just a histopathological diagnosis. And interestingly enough, the pathogenesis of anal cancer, cervical cancer is very, very similar, because it's the same kind of cells, the same transition zone. So this is uh, the person who really brought anal cancer, in my mind, out of the closet. The first time I've ever heard that somebody, that a celebrity that passed away from cancer was open about having an um, anal cancer, Osfera Fawcett, who unfortunately passed away from anal cancer. And this is the page from a website and their foundation who, um, you know, put a lot of effort into, although they don't, so don't say in the heading, is a, they say battle against cancer. They don't call it anal cancer on there, but if you go into the subheadings, it's all about anal cancer. So once again, just to make this point very clearly, and really it's, it's, it's I think, a perception that we really need to know about. So the rectum and the colon is lined by columnar epithelial cells. If you get rectal and colon cancer, which is very common, it's a totally different cancer. Rectum and colon cancer are not caused by HPV. The treatment is different. The outcomes are different. The survival is different. When we talk about anal cancer, we're literally just talking about this one to two centimeters to the outside because this is those squamous cells, and this is where the HPV virus likes to infect, cause cell changes, and cause dysplasia, and then in some unfortunate people, cancer. So if we look, this is the general population. This is US data looking at anal cancer rates. It's actually a very rare cancer, and I'll show you the relative rates in the general population. Um, it's really a between one and 2%. Interestingly enough, in the general population, females are more prone to get anal cancer than males. It's a very, it's, and the rate is fairly low. But if I put this slide up to just show you why this 
is a very important topic for us at this summit. And this, I don't know the study exactly, Karen, but this is the number that's quoted um, repeatedly by the experts in anal cancer and anal dysplasia. The anal cancer rates in, in MSM who are HIV negative is 35 per 100,000. In uh, HIV positive MSM is 75 to 135 per 100,000. Okay, so those are numbers. But what, what's the context of that numbers? If you look at the general population, it's one to two per 100,000. If you look at cervical cancer rates before, decades ago we started cervical cancer screening, which is a multi-billion dollar screening program. It was prior to cervical cancer, uh, to cervical PAPs, it was 40 to 50 per 100,000. Currently it's eight per 100,000 due to screening. So we know screening work, but we can also look at these figures and say, doesn't just looking at those figures, you know, constitute that we should really be screening at risk populations. And then just more perspective, colorectal cancer is about 56 per 100,000, the breast cancer 100 and something. So what are the risk factors for anal, for anal cancer and anal dysplasia? It's clumped together. High risk HPV infection is those dangerous HPV strains, the, what we call the oncogenic strains. HIV infection for sure, it's, it's the biggest risk factor. Multiple sex partners, so number of sex partners, and having anal intercourse, although it's a risk factor and it, getting anal cancer or anal displeasure does not mean that you've ever had anal intercourse in your life because it's a field effect and the virus get transmitted through skin. Smoking for sure, has, there's been a big association, and any other kind of immune compromise. So for example, people who are on steroids for medical conditions or had organ transplants where the immune system is being suppressed by drugs so that they don't reject the organ. So this is what's important for me in anal cancer detection. Early detection, this about, we talk about the five years of our rates, are pretty good. The treatment is pretty harsh, it's chemo radiation. But, well, 80%, it's pretty good. But once you get to later stages, it's pretty dismal. And for me being, having unfortunately walked this path with a few patients in my life who's died of anal cancer, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible death. And like, really, it's, it's horrific. And I think that inspired me to get in, involved in, in this field. So just a few words about the HPV. Michelle has told us it's a DNA virus. There's, it's a big family of viruses. There's hundreds of strains. Uh, 50 to 20 of them are cancer, potential ca cancer-forming strains. Once again, just because you, when you get an oncogenic strain doesn't mean you'll get cancer, it just puts you at risk. These are the oncogenic types, they're all numbered, but 16 and 18 are the ones when we talk about cervical and anal cancer that accounts for the vast majority of anal, uh, and cervical cancers. Six and 11 is the ones that most people will be familiar with because those are the ones that cause uh, warts. <laughs> Um, they don't cause cancer. But off, and one more point on HPV, a person can be infected with multiple strains and be reinfected and acquire more infection. So it's, you know, it's not just one or two that you get. And why is it so important in MSM? So this was a very interesting trial where they just looked at anal HPV infection. So it's not dysplasia or anything in all MSM, HIV positive or negative. And they looked at the percentage infected and looked at age groups. And the green line is any HPV, and the blue line is the percentage of people at different age groups that has high risk or oncogenic strains. Now why this slide is important, because in the general heterosexual population, these rates drop off. Like after 40, people often clear their, heterosexual people often clear their HPV infection. But this study has clearly shown that in, the MSM population, this clearly doesn't happen, and I think that's, this explains why there's more risk for anal cancer. Why does HPV cause um, cancer? Well, if our cells are exposed to any kind of mutagen, whether it's the virus or anything else, we have great mechanisms of regu regulating these abnormal cell growth, repairing the DNA that's been damaged, and then having normal cell growth happening. But the HPV, produces these proteins that inhibits this whole process. So if you have cells that starts to grow abnormally, they just continue without any suppression. And this is the spectrum of what happens. This is in the 
this can be the anus or the throat. This is the layer of cells that's the lining. And this is normal, and this is when HPV affects it, and we have different gradings of when these cells start to grow out abnormally until it becomes cancer. So this is the dysplasia part that we talk to uh, until these cells eventually eva invade and cause cancer. <coughs> so you've heard from Michelle, there's screening for anal dysplasia and anal cancer. It's called an anal pap test. It's not the best screening test there is, but it's all that we have at the moment. The best screening test would be what they do in the States. We do this combined with a test for what actual HPV strain you have. What it is, it's a, using this, <coughs> what we call a Dacron swap, and um, you scrape off cells in the anal canal, and then that gets looked under a microscope to look for abnormal cells that's growing under the influence of uh, HPV. This is a controversial question. Who should be screened? All HIV, MSM, for sure. This is what the experts in the field say. All <coughs> MSM, regardless of your HIV, over 40. Because we know anal cancer only started after 40. I don't think it's really useful to screen people earlier. All HIV positive people, people on a, that has, has an immune suppression, and then women with lots of HPV related disease. And this is what I do. We take a microscope, we apply acetic acid, and we look for abnormal cells here in the anal canal. So once again, not the colon or the rectum. And then if we find abnormal cells that we biopsy, we can treat it with a laser um, or hopefully detect early cancer. And this is what normal looks like. That's the rectum. This is the anal mucosa that I've been telling you about. Different kinds of cells. And the cells here transform. And because there's high activity, the HPV virus causes changes here. This is the area of dysplasia. So if we put this acetic acid on it, it looks abnormal, the blood vessels are abnormal, and this is the areas that we biopsy and treat and hopefully prevent cancer. So when we go f away from dysplasia to cancer, all the cancers that I've diagnosed myself, I've always felt, it's almost always palpable. Um, and often, this is the sad part for me, I know cancer is often diagnosed late because people think, or the doctors think or don't examine them, tell them, oh, you've got a bleeding hemorrhoid that's irritated use some hemorrhoid cream. So these are the things that people should be looking at. Of course, any kind of bleeding, if you feel anything, any kind of ulcer that's there that doesn't go away, difficulty pain, and sometimes this, you know, discharge or itching. Of course, most of the things that cause those symptoms are not cancer, but those are the commonly presenting symptoms that cancer does present with. And unfortunately, this is what cancer looks like. This is under a microscope, but terrible thing to see. Michelle has talked about the, vi the, vac the quadrivalent vaccine. It doesn't, the vaccine is just a capsid of the virus. It doesn't contain the DNA, and it elicits antibody response that hopefully fends off infection. And I'm going to end, once again, agreeing with Michelle. This was a landmark trial for anybody who's involved in anal cancer or anal dysplasia. It was the male HPV vaccine trial, but the subset of it was 600 gay guys that they compared placebo, so they got nothing versus the vaccine, double-blinded, and they looked at anal dysplasia acquisition in this group, and the, the difference between those who got the vaccine and those who got placebo was significant. So much so that for males, actually, the FDA, I, I think, approved the vaccine to be said it's preventative of anal cancer in men. In the females, the study wasn't done. So we can prevent so much just by giving a vaccine. And once again, I know this is you know, preaching to the choir or whatever, but I really think we need to get out there and be ad advocates for vaccination. And next year, or hopefully next year, there's, an, there's a nanovalent vaccine coming. So at the moment, we have four strains. So we're going to have 10 strains. And it's going to include more oncogenic strains. So I think we should really be advocating for that. Thanks.